Welcome to this Killick Explains Finance video. This week, an important and a big topic, what do investment managers and wealth planners do? Now, some people try and do both simultaneously as sort of one-man bands, if you like. Larger firms will be split into the two functions. Some do one, not the other. What is it? How do you tell the difference? When do you need which one? Now, there are two skill sets being described here, investment management, wealth planning, but actually one overall aim, really. And that comes down to what you consider wealth to actually be. In its original meaning, it means well-being, it means different things to different people. So investment management and wealth planners really should be aiming to maximize your financial health down that journey. But how? Well, first of all, let's look at some, uh, some similarities, if you like. So both are helping people who tend to fall into certain categories. Now, typically, people with not enough knowledge. Now, some people think, well, I have got all the knowledge I need to do my own investment management, my own wealth planning, but have you? Sometimes you don't know what you don't know. That's particularly true in relation to tax changes, wills, estate planning, and so on. People say, oh, I know how to diversify a portfolio, but do you? Number two, interest. There are lots of other things to get busy with in life. Families, enjoying retirement, and so on. So some people who could do this actually are not interested. They just want to farm it out, hand it over to somebody else who is more interested. And of course, time. We've only got so much of it. Financial markets excite some people who possibly need to get out more often and bore others. So there you have it. Now, in terms of three things they should not be, especially in the current regulatory environment, product driven. It is no use going to someone who's got a product and all they're going to do is try and sell it to you and make sure it fits your needs. That's no good. This should be about understanding what somebody wants and then designing a solution around that. Commission driven, that kind of goes hand in hand with the first point if you like. You should feel comfortable with an advisor saying you don't need to do anything. You're fine at the moment. You've done enough rather than always hectoring you to act in some way. And finally, poor value for money. Now that does not, does not, in any field, let alone this one, translators go for the cheapest solution. Cheap can be nasty, all right? But it does mean, am I paying a reasonable amount in fees, for example, in return for the service I'm getting? And that's a question you can ask outside financial services as well as within it. Now, language differences. So what sets these two skill sets apart? And they are slightly different. So investment management is all about risk tolerance, advisory versus discretionary, which is all about do you want to get involved, do you not want to get involved, if you like. Asset allocation decisions to fit an investment strategy, expected relative and absolute returns, and monitoring those on a regular basis, and performance against benchmark, however selected. And there are different benchmarks for different situations. Wealth planning has more holistic language around it, if you like, and that gives you the clue as to what makes it slightly different. It's all about financial life planning, retirement strategies, tax effective, saving is a big part of it, family protection and insurance, when things go wrong, intergenerational transfers, and estate planning and trusts. That is the slightly different language. So what does that translate into? Well, let's take a look at a few aspects of this. So objectives, again, some similarities, but some key differences too. So on the left, it's all about growing your money at an acceptable rate, taking account of your investment objectives and risk tolerance. And that's vital because risk and return tend to go together. Some people are more comfortable with risk than others. But investment managers can steer you in the right direction. Take a simple example. If you've got children and you're thinking about funding some sort of investment product on their behalf, they might as well take a bit of risk because they've got a massive long time horizon so you can actually be a bit less cautious than perhaps you might otherwise be and that could be a benefit long term. So it's stuff like that. Success is measured against financial benchmarks and targets. It's all about maximising the value of a portfolio, whether or not you're directly involved. Wealth planning, on the other hand, is a sort of broader sweep, if you like, helping you to decide what you consider to be a life well lived, what is being wealthy to you, and what wealth actually means. Then defining life goals and coming up with a plan that will meet them over time. So success is about achieving life goals, a bit of a broader remit, you could argue there, maximising your financial life, in other words. So the objectives, you can see, share some common ground, but are subtly different too. Now, along the way, so investment managers will define processes that guide your actions in a wide variety of market conditions because markets don't always go up, even if they have done over the last decade or so. Monitoring asset allocations to make sure they continue to meet your objectives and provide diversification. So in other words, uh, the, the baskets that you allocate assets to when you're very young may change as you get a family, may change pre-retirement, may change post-retirement. All right, so that needs to be monitored 
and reviewed and provide adequate diversification. So for example, as, as things join your portfolio, leave your portfolio, that will change the risk profile potentially. Investment managers can monitor that and help you make sure you've got the right trade-off in risk and reward. So it's all about regular valuation updates. Whereas on the right, it's more about defining actions that will enable you to achieve personal and family milestones. What are those goals? How are you gonna get there? And monitoring progress in the light of all sorts of things that can change as we travel through life. So personal changes, marriage, children, divorce, relocation, all right? First time successful marriages are in the minority now, unfortunately, so that creates a lot of diversity and divergence in terms of you know, life plans and where they can move to. Financial changes, so income levels can change as you move jobs, employment status, self-employed versus full-time employed, and self-employment is a more common thing for people to do, even quite late in life these days. And uh, inheritances, if you're lucky enough to receive them, that changes potentially the goalposts because it could be a, a surprise amount that suddenly comes in. Great, maybe you've just moved a little bit closer to those financial and life milestones. And of course, legislative changes. Anyone who's been awake for the last two or three years will know the government's introduced a huge number of changes. Hopefully the pace will now slow as we move through 2018. But nonetheless, you'll stay on top of those, particularly in areas like pensions, for example. So it's regular reviews against your goals. So the language is kind of similar, but also different. Now, a helping hand. People do tend to turn to professionals, quite rightly, in all sorts of fields when things go wrong in times of trouble. So, examples. On the left, managing and reducing the anxiety that comes from short-term market volatility. The stock market can be fickle. It can take some quite significant dips sometimes. It's crucial you don't do anything crazy around about that time that will put you right off course in terms of achieving your financial goals. So you've got to prevent knee-jerk reactions that can damage your portfolio. Panic selling being a classic and battle those unhelpful natural human biases that kept us alive on the savannah, if you like running away from tigers and the like, but are less useful when it comes to investing. We have all kinds of biases, confirmation bias, optimism bias that I deal with in different videos, those need to be countered. On the right, reducing the stress around important long-term decisions about your assets by putting a plan in place. So many people simply don't plan and that puts them in a state of constant stress. Have I done enough? Can I retire? I've got no idea. Right, so that's number one. Advising and stepping in during tough times. That can be a key role for the right kind of wealth planner. So whether it's disagreements between family members, divorce, a family death, who's on powers of attorney, all that kind of stuff. And avoiding legal and regulatory pitfalls of which there are an increasing number, unfortunately. Now what can go wrong? So watch out for, if you like, in both cases. Whether you're employing someone who claims to be able to do both, or whether you're looking at a larger firm where it might be two separate tranches of business, watch out for. So in both cases, look out for firms that are too big and expensive and simply can't tailor what they offer to you. They, by necessity, run off a kind of one-size-fits-all template. But equally, you'll think, well, that's a bit weird, but equally, don't go for firms that are too small if you suspect they haven't got the range of technical expertise and services that you need. So there's a trade-off there. And beware product-driven solutions in any environment. That sus niggling suspicion that someone's trying to flog you a high commission product, which frankly may or may not be suitable to what you want to do. Then look for a balance. So to turn this around to something a bit more positive, if you're looking for an investment manager or wealth planner, somebody to help you out, um, look for a balance between enthusiasm, technical expertise, and experience and judgment. Now, a friend of mine said, when you're looking for a surgeon, for example, you want someone in their 40s. Why? Because they've still got a bit of enthusiasm. They're not all gray and crusty and kind of cynical, if you like. Um, they've got enough technical expertise and they're probably maintaining it. It's an important caveat. And they'll have seen a different, decent number of people so they have experience and judgment. Now, I'm not suggesting that across the board, you only ever help look for help from people in their 40s, but you get the idea. It's that balancing act. Are they enthusiastic? I think that's, that's a key. Do they have the right technical expertise? Have they got enough experience and judgment? Have they seen enough people like me in order to be able to advise me? Okay, big topic. Any questions? Editor at killitcook.com. And if you'd like more on things like what is wealth planning, the nuts and bolts of investment management, portfolio management, asset allocation, all that good stuff, please do go to our free suite of videos, killitcook.com forward slash learn.